What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about cardiac tumors. We have some stuff to talk about. It's going to be a shorter vid that you're probably not used to, but we're going to have some fun doing it. If you guys like this video and you benefit from it, it makes sense, please support us. Hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, but most importantly, please subscribe. Also, down in the description box, we have some awesome notes, illustrations, that if you guys check out that link and go to our website, you guys can follow along with me during this process of this lecture, and I think it'll really help you guys to truly understand this topic. Without further ado, let's talk about cardiac tumors. So when we talk about cardiac tumors, we have to understand which ones there are. So there's secondary cardiac tumors and primary cardiac tumors. So we talk about these secondary cardiac tumors are gonna be the more common one. That's the first thing I want you guys to remember. So secondary cardiac tumors are gonna be by far the most common type of cardiac tumor. What does that mean? That means that these cardiac tumors came from some other area. The cardiac tumors that infiltrated the pericardium, the cardiac tumors that infiltrated the myocardium, they came from some other distant source, maybe a lung, maybe a breast, maybe some type of kidney tumor or lung cancer, something of that nature. It's spread from another site. That is the big one. Primary are gonna be way less common. They're actually relatively rare, but these actually form from the, the cardiac tissue in the heart and so this ones are going to be two types, myxoma and rhabdomyoma. They're relatively rare, but again, they aren't coming from a distant site. They're actually formed from the actual cardiac tissue or mesenchymal tissue from the actual heart itself. And they're relatively benign tumors. Okay, since we have established that, let's talk first about the secondary tumors, the more common types. So these are coming from other sites. What are those sites that are high yield to know, to be thinking about if this patient has an associated blah, blah, blah cancer, and now it's spread to their actual pericardium or myocardium and invaded that tissue, and now they have a tumor in that location, what are the other locations I should go looking for? In the most common effect, sequential order, we're gonna talk about these. So the first one, the most common location is going to be lung cancer. So if someone has lung cancer, and all of a sudden that spread to the actual pericardium of the heart, that would be the top one on the list. The next one is lymphoma. And when we talk about these lymphoma, there's two types. There's the Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. I would remember that this is more likely going to be the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The third most common one is going to be breast cancer. So breast cancer will be the third most common type of cancer that it would spread to the actual heart. The next one, the fourth one, is going to be leukemia. So leukemia would be the fourth most common one. The fifth one is going to be melanoma. The sixth one would be hepatocellular carcinoma. And then the last one here would be colorectal carcinoma. In these situations, if these cancers from their actual location spread to the actual heart and deposit into what two components of the heart tissue? The two most components that are specifically the ones that are remember here are the pericardium. So it'll inv invade the pericardium. So they'll have in pericardial invasion. Believe it or not, this is actually the most common one. And then it can also invade the myocardium. So the question that you have to ask yourself is, if they invade these two tissues, first off, which one is more common? And the second thing is, what are the downstream effects of this tumor invasion? So let's come down and talk about what happens with that. All right, my friends, pericardial invasion. This is gonna be one of those. So if a lung cancer tumor that actually spreads, disseminates to the actual pericardium, that's gonna be the more common site. Less common is gonna be the myocardial invasion. But regardless, if one of these tumors from any of these locations deposits into the cardiac tissue, particularly the pericardium, what is the downstream effects of that? Well, whenever these deposit into the pericardium, they can cause a lot of like neoplastic vascularization. They can cause a little bit of inflammation. And so this can lead to inflammation of the pericardium. This is called pericarditis, right? We talked about this in our pericarditis lecture. And then the subsequent effect of having pericarditis is inflammation that causes an increase in the serous fluid production. And that can cause increased fluid to develop within the pericardial cavity. What is that called? a pericardial effusion. So then you may see a subsequent pericardial effusion in these patients. The next thing that you have to be concerned about is that sometimes this fluid can accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and sometimes the, vas the vessels that are actually supplying those tumors can hemorrhage and can cause a massive accumulation of fluid that doesn't allow the pericardium to stretch anymore and squeezes in the heart and then you develop the scary cardiac tamponade. So these are big things to be thinking about. If a patient comes in and they're having pericarditis, pericardial effusion, cardiac tamponade, and you see all of these things and you start working them up, 
when you take fluid out of that area and you test it and send it for cytology, you're looking for some type of malignancy, whether it be from a lung, lymphoma, breast, leukemia, melanoma, hepatocellular, and colorectal. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why this is important. The other thing to think about here, which is really interesting and may come up, is that how does these actual tumors that come from the lung, the lymphoma, the breast cancer, the leukemia, the melanoma, the hepatocellular, and the colorectal, how does it get there? Usually when it spreads to the pericardium, it more commonly, believe it or not, involves the lymphatic system by which it spreads. In comparison, myocardial invasion, if these tumors that spread from these areas that we talked about spread via the blood, the vascular system, that tends to more commonly deposit into the myocardial tissue. And when you deposit into the myocardial tissue, it's gonna cause inflammation of the myocardial tissue. And that can lead to myocarditis. But the downstream effect of this is that if this happens over time, where the myocarditis gets worse and worse and worse, you lead to dysfunction of the myocardium. And dysfunction of the myocardium can lead to cardiomyopathy. And the type of cardiomyopathy that you definitely want to be thinking about here tends to be dilated as the more common type. Okay, so that's something to think about with these. Now that we've talked about the secondary cardiac tumors, let's now talk about the primary, that being myxoma and rhabdomyoma. All right, so now when we talk about primary cardiac tumors, there's two types, and these are relatively rare. Remember, the less common type of cardiac tumor. These form from the actual cardiac tissue itself. So when we talk about these, there's atrial myxoma and rhabdomyoma. Big epidemiological fact that you're gonna to wanna to think about, especially in the clinical vignette when they ask you these questions, is atrial myxoma is gonna be more common in adults. It's a simple way, I just think A for adults, A for atrial myxoma, okay? That leaves the next one, rhabdomyoma. This is gonna be more common in children. I don't know, maybe think about like the little rattlers that the kids use <laughs> for rhabdomyoma. But either way, that's one of the big things. More common one out of these is going to be the atrial myxoma. So let's talk about that one first and focus more on that one. When we talk about atrial myxoma, what happens in this condition is we don't actually know exactly how this occurs. It seems to be somewhat idiopathic or sporadic. There may be some genetic involvement here. But what happens is you see these tissue here, this black tissue, we're zooming into the left atrium. So we're zooming into this part looking at it. This tissue here, this black tissue, is called mesenchymal tissue. And what happens is the tissue, the mesenchymal tissue, of the interatrial septum is the general area. The interatrial septum spreads and forms this stalk and mass. And so it makes this pedunculated type of structure where you have the stalk and then that ball valve type of structure here, that mass is actually heavily gelatinous. So there's lots of ground substance that is within this. But the whole component of why this seems to be an issue is when you get this mesenchymal derivation from the interatrial septum that forms this stalk and gelatinous mass, what happens is that this thing can block the mitral valve opening and lead to obstructive symptoms and other complications that we'll talk about. So again, big thing here with atrial myxoma is the mesenchymal cells of the interatrial septum grow and derive into this stalk and gelatinous mass, which is consisting of a lot of ground substance. Why is that a problem? Good question. Let's pretend here that you have this stalk here, and then from the stalk you have that ball kind of like body component here that obstructs the mitral valve opening. Now blood is supposed to be able to get into the left ventricle via the mitral valve opening, but this is inhibited in this patient who has an atrial myxoma. So with that myxoma, you're gonna get obstructive symptoms. So obstruction of the mitral valve. What would that look like? Well, think about it. You're gonna get less ventricular filling. So less ventricular filling. If less blood fills the left ventricle during diastole, what's that called? A drop in preload. If you drop your preload, my friends, what's that gonna do? That's gonna drop your stroke volume. If you drop your stroke volume, you're gonna drop your cardiac output. And if you drop your cardiac output, can you deliver as much blood into the systemic circulation? No. And so you're gonna have a decreased perfusion to maybe a structure such as the central nervous system. If you have global malperfusion to the central nervous system for a small period of time, what can this lead to? Syncope. And so this patient may present with a syncopal event. The other thing is that if you're not getting enough perfusion or ejection out of the heart, sometimes that can back up into the lungs. Or you just get less perfusion out to the muscles, which are designed to be able to help you to perform certain activities like exerting yourselves. But either way, if there's some type of backing up of blood into the lungs and there's 
decreased perfusion to the muscles. Maybe the muscles aren't getting enough uh, oxygen and to be able to perform their function. If that is occurring, you're not getting enough oxygen that's being delivered to the muscles, you're, not getting, you're getting more blood backing up into the pulmonary circulation, what can happen here? This can lead to shortness of breath. And what this can look like in these patients is they tend to have what? They tend to have what's called dyspnea on exertion. We'll abbreviate that as DOE, dyspnea on exertion. They can have paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, shortness of breath when they're laying flat at night, or just whenever they're laying flat at all, they may have shortness of breath, and this is called orthopnea. So these are big things to be thinking about in this patient population. Okay, so obstruction of the mitral valve reduces filling, reduces ejection, and then less perfusion to the brain, syncope, or less perfusion to the muscles when you're exerting yourself, dyspnea on exertion, or fluid backing up into the lungs because you're having this obstruction and blood is backing up into the lungs, causing a little bit of pulmonary edema, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and orthopnea. Okay, what's another complication? Believe it or not, some pieces. So imagine here you have what's called, so you can have what's called myxoma, myxoma embolization. This is really interesting. So if you embolize pieces of the myxoma out into the circulation, so let's say that you break off a piece of that myxoma, and now that piece of the myxoma is in your systemic circulation. It can go and embolize wherever the heck it wants. What if it goes up and embolizes to the brain? So if you have a left-sided, emboli, this could obviously be problematic because this could embolize to the brain and this could lead to a stroke. So you could develop an acute ischemic stroke due to this. The other thing is what if it gets stuck within like the GIT? Then it may lead to mesenteric ischemia. It could get stuck in a limb causing a, a, an ischemic limb. You get the point. Either way, we could embolize pieces of that tumor and get stuck in small vessels. The other thing is, what if this actually is breaking off from a myxoma, less common, but a myxoma that's formed within the tricuspid valve area, or the right atrium, and you break off pieces of that. Now that's floating into the pulmonary circulation. And if that sucker gets into the pulmonary circulation, now you can't actually provide oxygen uh, to get pushed into the actual bloodstream for the pulmonary circulation and not CO2 getting, not being able to be exhaled out. And so that can lead to symptoms of a pulmonary embolism, shortness of breath, tachycardia, dyspnea, et cetera. And so think about right-sided emboli, less common, obviously, but if that were to happen and you got these suckers stuck up in the lungs, what would they develop? They could develop a pulmonary embolus. So don't forget about that. Okay, my friends, we've talked about the myxoma embolization. We talked about the obstruction of the mitral valve. What is another complication? This one's really interesting. So the other thing that you can have here is that this tumor can release something called inter- leukin-6. And that interleukin-6 can get into the bloodstream and go up to your brain. And when it goes up to the brain, it can act on a structure called the hypothalamus. So again, there's an increase in cytokines. And the particular type here tends to be interleukin-6. And what this does is this stimulates your hypothalamus. You know your hypothalamus controls your hunger, it controls your, uh, your body temperature. And so what happens is it'll up your body temperature and it'll increase fevers, it'll increase weight loss. And these are particular things that you may see, constitutional symptoms in these patients. So three particular categories of things. Obstruction of the mitral valve, which can lead to decreased cardiac output, syncope, and pulmonary edema or dyspnea on exertion, things of that nature. The other thing is you can embolize a piece of the myxoma, leading to, if it's left-sided, stroke, big thing, or if it's right-sided, PE. And last but not least, constitutional symptoms where they have lots of cytokines presenting with fever, malaise, weight loss. Last but not least is they can have a particular type of heart murmur. So they can have this very special, weird type of name murmur called a tumor plot murmur. And what happens is, imagine here, you have that stalk, okay, and blood's supposed to be moving into the left atrium and then going this way into the left ventricle. But what happens is, this little ball from that myxoma blocks that off. So kind of imagine it's kind of sitting here in the atria and then it just goes down and blocks off the actual mitral valve opening. When it does that, it makes like a weird kind of like sound. And that sound that you're gonna see here is called a tumor plop. So they'll have somewhat of a large kind of sound here at the early part of the diastole. But then a lot of blood is gonna try to creep around the sides of that little gelatinous mass, the atrial myxoma, and get out of the uh, atrium into the ventricles. But more blood will exit originally and then less blood will pass by. So the intensity of the murmur will decrease 
as you go towards the end of ventricular diastole. So this is called a diastolic, a decrescendo type of uh, rumbling murmur, just like mitral stenosis. Big thing to remember here is this is position dependent, so it can change in intensity with different positions. And where would you hear it? The same place that you would hear a patient who has mitral stenosis. You would hear this around that left, fifth, intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, my friends. Okay, so that's a big thing to think about. All right, we've covered that. Now let's move on to how do we diagnose it and treat it. All right, how do we diagnose this bad boy? Okay, so we have to get an echo. An echocardiogram is gonna be the best thing, but which type of echo? Would you get a TEE or TTE? Anytime you wanna look at the atria, the atria is a good one to use to get a TEE. So I would say for these patients, get yourself a transesophageal echocardiogram. That's gonna likely be the best one to take a look in the atria. That's what we would do for patients who have like left atrial thrombi and atrial fibrillation. It's just the better look at the atria. And what you're gonna be looking for is again, look for that stalk and look for that mass and look to see for it kind of ball valving within the atria down and obstructing the mitral valve orifice. That's the big thing to see. Now, from there, how do we treat this? It's very simple, it's surgical. If you surgically resect this mass, it's going to be curative. And again, this is a benign tumor. That's ex extremely important to remember, this is a benign tumor. So it's not gonna be something that you have to worry about metastasis with. If you surgically resect it, it's curative and you're done. The next thing to think about here is the last type of primary tumor here. Uh, it's less significant, but think about it really quickly, rhabdomyoma, again, more common in children. What is the underlying cause for this one? We don't actually completely have a pinpoint cause, but there seems to be an association with a very interesting condition. So we see this associated with something called tuberous sclerosis. So tuberous sclerosis, this is a genetic condition. And in tuberous sclerosis, they have an increase in the production of these things called hamartomas, hamartomas. And what hamartomas are, is their congenital malformations of a particular type of tissue. <clears throat> in this case for rhabdomyoma, it's some type of, you have muscle tissue, right? What happens is you take these striated muscle tissues, you take these striated muscle tissues, the cardiac tissue, and you're, whenever it's actually growing, it goes through this congenital malformation where it makes a clump of this tissue, and that clump of tissue that is malformed is now called a hamartoma. And these can deposit into the actual cardiac tissue. One of the more common locations that it can tend to deposit is within the ventricular walls. So these tend to deposit in the ventricular walls, but they can really deposit anywhere. But what you wanna be thinking with is associated with tuberous sclerosis is look for other tumors. So tumors that are in other locations of the bodies, especially if it's associated with tuberous sclerosis and in children. So what are we looking for? We're looking for certain types of tumors in the brain, looking for certain types of tumors within the kidneys, tumors that are developing within the eyes, tumors within the skin, and tumors within the lungs. That's about as far as I wanna go with these. I don't wanna go down the rabbit hole of tuberous sclerosis and looking into that condition. Because again, big thing for rhabdomyoma, less common in children associated with tuberous sclerosis, there's an increase in these things called hamartomas, which are congenital malformations of striated cardiac tissue in this situation for rhabdomyoma. But again, in tuberous sclerosis, they have a bunch of different types of hamartomas that form all over the body. And in this case, these are some of the locations. How do we diagnose it? It's the same thing. Get yourself an echocardiogram. You can do a TTE first, but I would say a TEE would be probably best in this patient population. And again, what you're looking for is some type of tumor that's not pedunculated, doesn't have a stalk, it's unlikely to be within the atria, usually within the ventricular walls. And then the best thing to think about here is, what would be the cause? You can go ahead and do genetic testing, so you can do plus or minus genetic testing where you look for specific types of genes like the TSC1 and TSC2 genes and tuberous sclerosis for their different types of uh, uh, proteins that are actually forming these different types of hamartomas in these situations. You can go ahead and do genetic testing for tuberous sclerosis. But I think the big thing is here, once you find this mass, you see that there isn't associated with tuberous sclerosis, what you can do is you can actually leave it alone. But if these patients start to develop symptoms, maybe it's actually obstructing the left ventricular outflow tract, maybe it's causing heart failure types of symptoms. If the patient is de developing symptoms, then the best treatment is surgical resection. And my friends, that covers cardiac tumors. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.